getting ready for the last day. Now, I'm, my family's all from Kentucky. My, my mother's side's from Alabama. My father's side is all from Kentucky, Greenup County. And uh, so I didn't put getting ready, I put getting ready for the last days. And we're not only in the last days, I believe we are in the last hours. But a part of getting ready, part of the task that we have, part of the task that God has uh, given to me as a pastor is to prepare you as individuals and those who would listen to me as to how to be prepared to stand and not only stand, but stand in victory and as overcomers in the last days. The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy, the third chapter, I believe this is in your notes, that mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. Evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Deceiving and being deceived. That's an interesting statement, and we could spend a little bit of time there. Well, not today. But the theme, the background story to this theme that we have been looking at, delving into, and studying for the last few weeks on spotting and avoiding manipulation. And our background story, that is a perfect illustration and example of manipulation, is found in 2 Samuel, the 15th chapter, verses 5 and 6. And it's the story of David's son, Absalom. As we gave you background the last couple of weeks, and you'll need to study it for yourself in 2 Samuel, you'll find that that story, which is a sad story, it's a tragic story of, of the life and the, the inner family life of David's family. And Absalom was a son that was filled with promise. He was filled with tremendous ability. He was a very handsome man. Uh, they said he was, there was no blemish found in him. He was evidently a very handsome young man, but he had a great thirst and desire for attention and for power. And he yielded to the temptation, evidently, to become a manipulator and rose up against his own father, who was king of, the, of Israel at that time. And he rose up against him, not, he did eventually, militarily, but initially, he rose up against him through this weapon and device called manipulation. And it says in verses 5 and 6, when anyone approached him to bow down before him, Absalom would reach out his hand. Let me back up for a moment. He positioned himself and, and his carriage, his chariot, near, uh, he positioned himself near the gate. The city gates were where all, of course, entry and exit of the city, all the business of the city was traditionally done, and even judgments were handed down at the gate of the city. So as you read the Old Testament, as you read about a gate, you, you must understand it was more than just an architectural, architectural part of a wall, but actually it was a very, the very center of a lot of social activity for the nation and for the city, and in particular Jerusalem. And he would position himself by the gate, and that way anyone coming and going would spot him, recognize him. He was somewhat of a celebrity. He was the king's son, one of the king's son. And when they would approach him to bow down before him, which was traditional to show respect, Absalom would reach out his hand, take hold of him, and kiss him. And it says that Absalom behaved in this way toward all the Israelites who came to the king asking for justice. And listen to this phrase, and so, in other words, in this manner, and by these actions, he stole the hearts of the people of Israel. That is a perfect picture, story of a manipulator and this thing that we call manipulation. So I'm going to quickly just recap. I'm certainly not going to take the time for those of you who have been here the last couple of weeks to go over the message again. You're able to get on YouTube and hear the messages in their entirety if you would like to. But let's just really background real quickly here. What is manipulation? We're talking about spotting and avoiding manipulation. And again, this is part three. But what is manipulation? And we pointed out the fact to you that manipulation comes from a very bad family. It has very bad relatives. Manipulation often uses deception. We talked about this. Deception is the act of misleading or causing someone to accept as true or valid what is actually false or invalid to deceive someone, to use trickery, to deceive them. And there's a multiplicity of ways in which you can do that. Deception. The Bible calls Satan 
the great deceiver. He uses deception. It was through deception that, that Eve was tricked in the garden. But Adam sinned willfully. Adam sinned with knowledge. But it was deception that was used in the very beginning. And even in the last book of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, towards the very last few verses of that book that is in your New Testament, the word and the name that is connected with Satan and the devil is the word deceiver. He who deceived the nation. So what is going on right now around the world for the propagation and the expansion of evil and everything that is opposed to God and his kingdom is being done through a variety of methods, but the Bible in particular focuses upon that method that is most effective and it's called deception. But deception is related to, and manipulation is related to another cousin, and that's called intimidation. And all of us have experienced intimidation. And all of us have experienced, in fact, today there is a new term called bullying. Intimidation is very closely related to manipulation. Manipulation and deception are more, shall we say, they're, more, they're, they're dressed in finer clothing than intimidation. Intimidation is just in your face. It's right out front. It is what it is. It is defined as the action of frightening or threatening someone. There's very many ways in which you can be threatened. Someone with a powerful personality, someone in a position of power, someone ha who has leverage over you or has the ability to do you harm or has the potential to negatively affect your life or your reputation. They can use, they can use intimidation to literally frighten or threaten you, to, to persuade you to do something that you may not want to do, and initially, and, and of course, primarily, they want you to do. They intimidate you into doing what they want you to do. This is a, the primary weapon in intimidation is fear. Individuals give in to intimidation out of fear. But they're all related together. Now, manipulation... Is, is different in that it's to manage or utilize skillfully. It uses a finer tool. It uses a scalpel um, rather as opposed to intimidation uses an ax. In, uh, manipulation would use a scalpel, but it still takes, can take the same amount of flesh. It is the skillful handling, controlling, or using of something or someone. You can manipulate, as I said, we learned that manipulation is not necessarily always evil in its connotation. Manipulation, I can manipulate clay. An artist, a skillful artist, can manipulate clay to create an incredible statue or figure. The manipulation of something, is the, it means the skillful, skillful utilization or management of something. Now there's a difference we learn between charisma and winsomeness. Some people are just genuinely winsome. Some people just have an inherited charisma about them. There's a difference between that and manipulation. There is a difference between the power of persuasion and manipulation. I will confess to you that I will take all of the per persuasive power that the Holy Spirit will give me when I'm declaring the Word of God. But the difference, the, the, the core difference between manipulation that we speak of today and that God condemns and hates and that connects us with the activities of the devil is that manipulation is used for selfish purposes, for selfish intentions. I may persuade you for anything but selfish reasons. I persuade you so that you can not only make it to heaven, but so that you can know God and know His Son, Jesus Christ, and walk in and fulfill that which God has for you. I can use persuasion if the Holy Spirit helps and aids, but I also, but that is different than manipulation. Manipulation carries selfish connotation with it. It is something done that really is, is that which is hated and despised by God. It is condemned because it is motivated by fear or selfishness, or sometimes both. It, could, it involves a form of trickery or deception to accomplish its purpose in your life. And it tries to control the actions or choices of another for selfish reasons. It tries to take away, it takes away your own self-autonomy. Now, 
Manipulation is, is everywhere that humanity is. Deception is everywhere humanity is. Intimidation is everywhere humanity is. But we must understand that entities, institutions, media, government can and do use all three of these weapons, but particularly manipulation, as it tries to control the actions and choices of, of a society or groups of people or large groups of people. But most of the times, and by the way, in regards to government, we are, we've entered an era where government has given in, in, mo in many cases, to the temptation to manipulate and deceive because government and those in government, as we have learned and we'll learn here in a few minutes, are filled with pride and arrogance. Many, many are filled with pride and arrogance. And when pride and arrogance is on board, pride and arrogance believes it knows best what you should do. And therefore it will use any means for your own good to cause a people or group of people to go the direction the government wants you to go. Now I'm talking much different than the principles of liberty that must have uh, walls of protection about it, otherwise it lapses into the definition of license. Liberty is not license. License is doing anything without control, whether good or bad, moral or immoral, destructive or non-destructive, license is not liberty. Liberty is that which has the precepts literally of God's kingdom as a, a line around it to protect true freedom and liberty. And governments are called to initiate, institute, and protect liberty. But governments are not called to become dictatorships or, or those in authority that control and tell a society literally every move to make for evil intentions and selfish reasons. But most of the time, you and I encounter manipulation will be through individuals. Many times those individuals are, that are most successful in manipulating us are individuals we're very close to, or we have a close working relationship with them, or we come into contact with them daily or at least regularly. These individuals are the ones who are you and I most through, through you, whom you and I most encounter manipulation. So, we're on point number four today, and let's pick it up right there. What makes a person vulnerable to manipulation? What makes a person vulnerable to manipulation? Now, on a societal level, we don't, I don't have time today to go into that, but certainly there, there is, uh, we are all, let me say, say this, we are all vulnerable to deception and manipulation. In fact, if you believe because of your pedigree or your education or your intelligence or your savvy or anything else that you are not susceptible to deception, you're already deceived. Because deception carries with it an inherent blindness. And so when I am deceived, I don't know I'm deceived. That's one of the powers of deception. So we're all, we are all susceptible to manipulation and deception. That's why we must be careful, we must be on our toes. If you're not watching, if you're not really listening, you can be swept along with the flow. You can be swept along with the masses. Now Jesus was speaking to his own disciples in Matthew the 24th chapter. Now these are individuals that have followed him for the length of his ministry. We're coming down to the concluding days. And Jesus is speaking to those who have heard his words, seen his miracles, walked with him, literally lived with him, and will become the leaders of Christianity. And Jesus has put his trust in them, and yet Jesus gives this strong warning to those who were the elite, so to speak, of Christianity of that day. They were the ones who had left all. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 4, Watch out that no one deceives you. Watch out, be alert, be awake. And so that is imperative for you and I, that we be alert, awake, we stay alert. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Now on a personal level, as people become more and more selfish, manipulation will increase. Our own weaknesses 
can make us vulnerable to manipulation. And we all have weaknesses. We all have areas of weakness. As I go down through a short list here, I'm sure we're all going to be able to identify with some of these, if not all of these. But one of the things that makes us particularly vulnerable to manipulation or a, a manipulator is that one or some of these characteristics are dominant in our lives. They are a dominant desire. They are a deep, dominant desire in your life. And because this is a dominant, powerful desire or need in your life, <clears throat> it makes you susceptible to manipulation. Let's go down through a, a few of them. First of all, a fearful atmosphere or spirit. We saw this take place, and I don't have time to, <clears throat> again, I wish I could, but just three years ago, we saw as this new created disease created in a Chinese laboratory swept across the world, an atmosphere, I have never lived or existed in an atmosphere of fear, and, and it, was, it, it was and is a genuine disease. We're not in denial. It did end the lives of millions of people, but it created an atmosphere of fear. It was almost palpable across the nation, and it made us vulnerable and whole societies and nations vulnerable to manipulation and deception. A fearful atmosphere or a fearful individual, a spirit of fear in your life, fear of man's opinion, fear of rejection. Maybe you've experienced rejection in your life and you, you have a fear of being rejected by people. Perhaps you have a fear of pain or discomfort. Or maybe you have a fear of the penalty of not going along. You're, you're afraid of the ramifications, of the results, and therefore you are in a spirit of fear that makes you vulnerable to manipulation. A spirit of fear makes a person vulnerable to manipulation. A, a, a low self-esteem, a deep desire for love and acceptance. And we all have a deep desire for love. All of us want to be accepted. I don't know of anyone in here that, that really, if you ask them, would say, no, I want everybody in the world to hate me. None of us do. Everyone wants a certain level of acceptance. But remember, when this becomes a dominant overriding theme in your mind and need, a need in your heart, you must have, you are seeking for love. There was an old song that said, looking for love in all the wrong places. You're seeking, you're desiring, you have an overwhelming desire for love and acceptance, to feel important, to be made to feel important. You are open prey for a manipulator, a desire to please, a people pleaser, afraid to hurt someone's feelings, fearful of hurting anyone's feelings, desiring to walk through life without offending anyone. You're a people pleaser. You, you are concerned and you want everyone to like you. A desire to please, that makes you open to manipulation. Ambitious. Now, everyone has the ambition. In fact, that, that's part of how God has created us. But again, this is an individual that would be dri driven, driven to do something, to be something, to be great, to have their name noticed, to do something wonderful. They're driven with ambition to earn this amount of money. They have goals. They're ambitious. It makes you vulnerable, believe it or not, to a skillful manipulator. It is a weakness. And isolation and loneliness makes you vulnerable to a manipulator, a hunger for companionship, a deep desire for attention. You're longing. You feel like no one really loves you. You feel like, you feel like no one pays much attention. You're, we see that on social media. Social media has become a, a tremendous insight, a, a, a magnified camera into the lives of individuals. I am just astonished what people put on Facebook and on TikTok and social media. I am blown away how they are so hungry for attention, so hungry for someone to give them a thumb up or a like or a comment. And they're desiring this attention. That makes you 100% vulnerable to manipulation. Somebody who's a good manipulator will take that weakness and will utilize it to their own benefit. Naivety, what does that mean? It means you're naive. 
It means you have a certain ignorance and innocence about life. The Bible says in Romans 16, 18, For such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. Manipulators use smooth talk. Oh, they're good at it. They know how to read people. And they're very good at it. You'll never know you're being manipulated. Because they use smooth talk and flattery. I remember I had a friend that before I would leave his presence, he would hug me and, and whisper in my ear, you're special. I thought that was really nice until I discovered that everybody he hugged, he whispered in their ear, they're special. That, that is, that smooth, it feels good. <clears throat> that feels so good. And, and so that smooth talk, and all of that appeals to individuals who are naive. Naive means deficient in worldly wisdom or informed judgment. Open prey. And then finally, the last weakness and vulnerability is pride, believe it or not. Pride is the greatest weakness. Because pride, like deception, is personally blinding. An individual who is proud does not know they're proud. Let me say that again. An individual who is proud and everyone around them knows they're proud does not know they're proud. They would, in fact, defend their humility. And a proud pride blinds the individual that, that has it. But because of pride, it actually makes you an easy target for a manipulator. A manipulator, again, many of them are very intelligent and very good at reading people. <clears throat> and so they read that person that's proud, and they play into that. And if you're proud, they give you what you want to hear. And so, it, it, you know, and, and it's amazing, sometimes down through the years, I have been gently trying to help an individual that I recognize as being deceived. <clears throat> and I mean, it's very apparent. And as I'm talking to them, they keep interrupting me. And they keep saying, I know. <clears throat> oh, I know. Oh, I know. And I get to the point where I just give up. I think I can't tell you anything. You're not listening to me. That's all, that is all an indication of pride. And pride fools the individual and a manipulator. It makes you most vulnerable to manipulation. So how do I stay, point number five, how do I stay alert and spot deception and manipulation? What are some basic principles that will help me to not be deceived, to not be manip manipulated? Of course, you know if you're being intimidated because you cower down to that individual or that institution. You cower down to their wishes and their desires against your own. You sacrifice your own self-worth and self-choice for theirs because you're intimidated. But manipula manipulation and deception are different. So what is the first thing that I can do to help myself stay alert from deception, to spot deception and manipulation? It sounds very easy, but it's not. Number one, desire truth. Honestly, wholeheartedly, sincerely, desire truth. And let's break that down, desire. This means I'm willing to give truth priority in my life and in my decisions. As truth comes to me, and as God is faithful to show me truth, about my situation, or about any given situation, or decision-making <clears throat> situation that I'm in, where others are seeking to influence me, desire truth. And it means that you put truth at the top of your priorities. Desiring truth as opposed to denying truth. And we've all seen individuals that have denied the truth. And we walk away shaking our head. My wife and I will say, why can't they see that? And they deny the truth. The thing that needs to first take place in your heart is you need to say to the Lord God, I desire truth. God, I want truth. And I will prioritize truth. Now, I am convinced that God is faithful. And many times the course that we take is not a course of total ignorance. Because God is faithful to our conscience. He has given you a conscience. And God is faithful through His Spirit. Now, I, can, I do believe we can get into a place where we are totally operating out of ignorance. 
But I believe most often God gives us a heads up. And therefore, we have to make a priority. I desire truth. And God, if you give me a heads up, regardless of how distasteful it may be to me, regardless of how I may not want to hear it, regardless of what the ramifications might be of me obeying the truth, I want to hear the truth. Desire truth. Now, when Jesus stood before Pilate just prior to his crucifixion, when he was through the mock trial and the sham that they called justice and and legal, uh, actual legal steps towards crucifixion, when he stood before Pilate, Pilate, very powerful procurator in that day, and Pilate asked him, and at one point he said, um, truth, he used the word truth. I have come as a witness, a testimony to truth. And Pilate shot back at him, I do not believe a question that was asked in a, in a matter of, of uh, some type of insult. I believe it was an exposure of his heart and of the day in which he was living and the day in which we are living. Pilate, the very learned Roman, looked at Jesus and said, what is truth? When Jesus made reference to truth. Pilate said, what is truth? I believe that was a deep look into his heart that he truly did not know what truth was, that he had read philosophers debating truth, and he lived in a day as if we're, as we're living in today, a postmodern relativism where truth is what you create it to be. Where 97% of the young people of this age, almost 100%, entering freshman year of college, deny anything such as absolute truth. And so they, they believe that truth is not what you discover, it is what you create. And so truth, however, is not that listed as that within the Word of God. The Word of God tells us that we can know the truth. Jesus said, you can, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Now what is truth? Very quickly, Jesus is truth. John 14, 6. He said, I am the way and the truth and the light. That's why there's such an attack on Jesus. Because the dark forces know he's the truth. Number two, the Holy Spirit is the truth. But when he, John 16, 13, this is Jesus speaking, when he comes, the Spirit of truth, he will guide you into all truth. <clears throat> so the Holy Spirit of God is truth. And if we are born again and we've given our heart to Christ, we truly have asked God to live in our heart and life, and we're seeking to follow Him, the Bible tells us that He gives us the Spirit of truth. In fact, the Bible in one place says, if a man not have not the Spirit of truth, he does not belong to Christ. It is one of the evidences that you're a child of God. Then thirdly, the Bible is truth. Jesus himself also said in John 17, 17, in his prayer to his Father, he said, sanctify them by thy truth, your word is truth. So Jesus is truth, the Holy Spirit is truth, and the Bible is truth. We have three weapons, three instruments as well that can help us to know the truth and help us when we desire truth. So when you say to God, I desire truth, I want to be made aware, I want to be alert, I desire truth, you're saying, Holy Spirit, speak to me, Jesus, I'm going to follow you, and I'm going to follow your word. That is desiring truth. Now the second item that will give us a heads up in regards to ma manipulation is pray for discernment. Now that word discernment is used in a variety of ways today, but discernment in the Bible, when it refers to discernment, is the spiritual characteristic of sound judgment. Perceiving the difference between right and wrong, good and evil, truth and error. The ability that God has given by His Holy Spirit to identify God's will and direction in your life. The Bible said in Malachi, the third chapter, God said to His people through the prophet Malachi, He said, when you return to me, <clears throat> listen to this, when you return to me, the source of truth, then you will again discern between the righteous and the wicked. Now that indicates, without discernment, just with good old horse sense, you will not always be able to differentiate 
between righteous and wicked. No, you will not be able to always spot who is righteous and who is wicked. Now sometimes it's very evident. But at other times it's shielded. And God said to his people, I'll give you the ability to discern by my spirit the difference between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. That's directly taken out of the Bible. Malachi 3.18. God says, I'll give you discernment. That is a definition of discernment. Discernment is necessary to understand spiritual truth. It's necessary to live holy as God would have you to, to avoid life's pitfalls and dangers. Discernment is needed. Now discernment is also a gift of the Spirit. Now what do I mean by that? I mean that God gives all of His people a certain level of discernment who desire and are willing to obey truth. But in particular, the Bible speaks of one of the gifts of the Spirit, and gifts are given, not earned. The Holy Spirit decides who receives gifts, and not, all, not everyone has the gift of discernment. The discernment as a gift means a higher level of operation. A higher level of operation. Someone who operates at a level that is in, 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 not in comparison to many others because it is a gift to them. It's given to help lead the body of Christ. In fact, I think one of the most necessary gifts that God gives to anyone who's truly called to pastor is the gift of discernment. Because God wants the pastor to be able to spot wolves in sheep's clothing. God gives the gift of discernment, and, and often he has done this for me, that I have seen people that I'm pastoring, I've seen all of a sudden or become made aware of that they are being manipulated. It becomes very apparent to me. They're being deceived. And I see it, and they don't see it. Now you say, how do you see it? Because God, God has put me as shepherd over certain people that God has called to sit under the ministry that God has given to me. Not everyone is called to sit under this ministry. I would never presume to say that. God has other shepherds in this area, in this region. Millions of shepherds across the world. But I believe one of the defining characteristics of someone called the pastor is they have the gift of... Now... Discernment is a step above a gut feel. Some of you are thinking, well, I've had a gut feel about this person, and maybe you've even said that. I don't know, something just didn't sit right. Or a mother's intuition, and I agree with that. Women seem to have a special intuition as a gift from God to them, but that's distinct from the gift of discernment. The gift of discernment is that gut feel on steroids. It's that gut feel, it's, it's like an alarm goes off, and you may not with your mind, and often it's that way with me. They say, well, why do you feel that way? I can't tell you why I feel that way, but there's something wrong here. I'm getting alarm signals, there's a bell going off, there's something about that person. And what is my response to them? Well, my response to them is not to reject them, my response to them is not to oppose them. But my response to them is to watch and wait as God leads and guides and gives, gives discernment. Now dis discernment, I must point out, is different also than suspicion. <clears throat> People say, well, I was suspicious. You know, well, suspicion, you don't even need to be a Christian to be suspicious. In fact, there's been many movies. In fact, there was a famous movie made about suspicion. But suspicion operates mostly in the flesh. It is the intuitive ability to add two plus two and to put some things together, circumstances, experiences, evidences, and all of a sudden it builds a case within you. You begin to recognize something isn't, have you heard this phrase? Something isn't adding up. Something doesn't quite add up. Now that is a natural ability. Animals don't have that ability. Animals have senses, but animals don't have that ability to come to a case or a conclusion and be suspicious of something. But do not, con do not uh, somehow confuse discernment with suspicion. Discernment is an inward knowledge that is imparted by the Spirit. Suspicion is something that is a compilation of, of, of 
either actions or evidences or words or statements that you've quickly added together, and because you have a good mind, you say there's something wrong here. Now God uses that too. But what is most valuable to you as a child of God in these last days, when Jesus warned his own disciples, watch out that no one deceives you, and the Bible warns us scarcely, I pointed out to you last week, there is scarcely a verse or scripture group in the Bible talking, referring to the last days, the times just before, those critical times just before the return of Christ, those times that will try every man's soul, those critical times, scarcely is there a section that refers to that that does not also refer to deception or deceiving. And so you and I must be on guard. Does that mean that we walk around constantly nervous, constantly in fear? No, fear is not of God. Fear is not of God, it is of the enemy. God has not given us the spirit of fear, the Bible says, but of a sound mind and of love. And so God would not have us walk around in fear, and yet God would not have us walk around naive. In the middle is God would have us walk around as a people who desire truth truly and pray for discernment. And God is faithful to answer that prayer. Now we're going to close. I'm not going to finish this message today. I want to give you a bite at a time. I know I'm stretching it out, but I feel like we need to chew on this. And I want to just point out to you that preaching, some, some, there was an old timer that said, said it preaches easy and it lives hard. Preaching about desiring truth to the point where you prioritize it in your life is not easy. Standing up, once identified, standing up against manipulation, standing up against intimidation is anything but easy. It will require of you commitment. It will require of you consecration. Following Jesus Christ, we have made it far too easy in our interpretation of the Bible in 2024. You know, Jesus said to the people in that day, he said, anyone who leaves father, anyone who loves father or mother, son or daughter, who will not take up their cross, son or daughter more than me, anyone who loves father or mother more than me, anyone who loves their family more than me and will not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. That's pretty strong words. But we kind of, today, we say, well, that was, that was back then, and that was a special group, and, you know, Christianity was just getting off the ground, and Jesus was, you know, that was a little different than today. God understands today. Jesus, Jesus has given us a, a different version for today, the United States version. I just heard probably a month ago that in Pakistan, and I can't remember the percentage, I want to say it, but I, for, for fear of being disac you know, inaccurate, I will not. But a high percentage of individuals who give their life to Christ and accept Him as their Savior in Pakistan today are dead within six months. That was through a pastor that was preaching that. In a Middle Eastern country, those people recognize that there is a price to pay. And you and I, if we're truly going to be alert and walk in victory, need to recognize that it's very easy to say, I desire truth, but it's quite another thing to stand for truth, to follow truth. That when God has shown you what he wants you to do, despite intimidation, despite the potential loss of family, the potential loss of friends. You say, but you don't know what it'll be like at holidays now. You, you just don't understand. Oh, really? Let me get this right. They're dying in this country, and you're worried about a cold shoulder here. To stand for truth today is not easy. And willing to stand alone 
is not easy. Sounds easy, preaches easy, lives hard. But I tell you, that's what Christ is asking you and I to do. We are called to desire and obey and stand by the truth. Even when friends who we love dearly, who we care about, even when friends, there is a threat of losing relationship and friends, maybe the rest of your life, will you stand for truth and do what God has told you to do? That's the question. Well, there is a verse that says that if we will do that, we bring great joy to God's heart. In fact, in 3 John, it says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that you as my children are walking in the truth. You say, well, this must be some kind of a unique punishment that God just, he desires to make life rough for us. No, it is not. It is the way of freedom. It is the way of liberty. But it costs something. It is the way of true blessing from God. Because don't forget, the same God, the same Jesus has said, if you're not, if you love them more than me, if you love them more than me, if you're not willing to do this, you're not worthy of me. He went on in another place and said, everyone who has left mother or father or family or houses, or lands, for my sake, will receive, will be rewarded a hundredfold, both here and in eternity. God is faithful. Jesus is faithful. Jesus is faithful to you and to me. We may not see it here. You may not see the blessing here. It may follow you to heaven. But there, were, there is coming a day coming a time when we are going to stand in the judgment before Christ, all of us. And there is coming a time when we will receive an opportunity to hear from Him. And the whole world, I believe. I saw you when you did this. I knew the pressure. I saw the tears on your pillow. I know what this cost you. And I want you to know that because you followed me, you took up your cross, enter Enter into the blessing. Enter into the reward. Enter into that which you cannot imagine. Because you were faithful in a little, I will make you ruler over much. Challenging, isn't it? Challenging. But it is the way to freedom and liberty. And it is the way to have victory over manipulation and intimidation. Some time Ladies and gentlemen, you're just going to have to simply stand up. And we're going to talk next week, God willing, about how do I do that? How in the world do I do that? How do I say yes to truth? How do I say I'm going to go no matter what? I'm going to obey no matter what the consequences. How do I do that? When they, defriend, they unfriend me and they don't call me and they tell me to take take my, my num their number out of my phone, and all of these things. How do I do that? Next week we're going to talk about that. The Bible gives us the key. There is a key. But right now let's pray, because this, this is very real. What we're going through is very real. Maybe what you're going through in your own life is very real. And we're going to pray right now before you leave. Now, Father, we, I sense the attentiveness of every individual here. I sense there's some wrestling going on and some hearts. There may be some conviction. As you, Spirit of Truth, zeroed in. I want to ask your forgiveness, Father. If I've ever misled anyone that this, this journey, this life, as a Christian, is easy. You never promised it would be easy. But you did promise. You did promise that we would not go alone. You did promise that you would never leave us nor forsake us. You did 
promise that you would stick closer than a brother, that you would be a friend if all other friends forsake us. You did promise that you would not point down a lonely road and say, go, but you would invite us to walk with you and you said, come. The road will not be easy, but we'll walk together. The road may have some bumps in it. You may not see all the way to the end. There may be some dark valleys, but we will walk together. And I will make you more than a conqueror. I will give you the strength when you need it. I will supply the grace when you have to have it. I will not forsake you. I am your savior. I love your soul. I died for you. You're more than a number. You're more than a name. Your very hairs, the very hairs of your head are counted. I love you that much. And you are much more value than a sparrow that falls to the ground. I have an intention. I have a purpose. I have a destiny. I have a plan for you. I know the thoughts I think towards you. Good thoughts. Thoughts to give you an intended end and purpose. Thoughts to prosper you. Thoughts to bless you. But Lord, the way we walk in that blessing is we leave it all behind. I left it all to find everything. I died a pauper to be born a king. When I learned how to lose, I found out how to win. I lost it all to find everything. Today, may there be a deep decision in the heart of someone within my voice, the range of my voice, maybe listening on YouTube, that will say, that's the key. That's the key. I'm half in, I'm half out. I'm hanging halfway on and halfway off. I'm going to get all the way in. And Jesus, I'm going to trust you. You're going to give me discernment. You're going to help me to know the truth. You're going to guide my decisions. You're going to give me true liberty and freedom. But I'm going to come all the way into the kingdom. I'm yours. Lock, stock, and barrel. I'm yours today. And Jesus, when, you, when they do that, you come in in a mighty rush to fill the void and to fill their heart. And you, O oh God, begin to launch them in a walk that they could never imagine, where you give them, O oh God, the, the secrets and give them, O oh God, the guidance and the direction and whatever is needed to walk as a child of God, a child of the living King. We thank you for that. We thank you for your promise. And we thank you for victory. We do not leave as a bedraggled, beaten down, tail between our legs church. We leave today as children of the living King, children of God. We leave today with our head held high, not in human pride, but in recognizing that we have been bought by the blood of Jesus. And if God be for us, who can be against us? We leave with that assurance and we pray it all unmistakably, without shame, in the name of Jesus. Amen.